and on behalf of my partner, Betsy Burton, and the staff of the King's English, I'd like to thank you uh, for coming to this reading and discussion tonight. Um, the book was written by Joan and Richard Osling, and we're fortunate to have Richard with us tonight. Joan is doing some publicity touring in Connecticut, so she couldn't be with us. Richard Osling was formerly senior correspondent for Time Magazine. During his 27 years with the magazine, he wrote 23 cover stories, including one on the Mormon Church in August of 1977. 1997. He broadcast Report on Religion, which is syndicated nationwide twice a week on CBS radio, and does regular religion reports on PBS's The News Hour with Jim Lehrer. His wife, Joan, is a freelance writer and editor. She's the co-author of C.S. Lewis, an annotated checklist of writings about him and his work. She's worked as a college English and journalism teacher, a newspaper reporter, and a writer editor with the U.S. Information Agency. The book they've written is a fascinating look at the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing religions in the world, and of particular interest to those of us who live in the state of Utah. Membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it is, as it is properly known, is around 10 million. And if current growth continues, by the year 2080, it will be either 63 million or 265 million. It depends on the sources you're looking at. And it's one of the questions I would like to ask Mr. Austin. Um, relative to its size, the Mormon Church is also one of the wealthiest churches in the world. In this book, the Austins examine the holdings and investments of the church in detail. Mormon America is a balanced and impartial view of the history, beliefs, social, cultural, and religious practices of the LDS people. All in all, they furnish us with an enthralling look at a church and a people who impact our everyday lives as residents of Utah. Please join me in welcoming you. Mm -hmm. I think I'll stand up, but that's okay. It doesn't mess you up. Um, so why did, we, uh, why did we write this book? Um, it's an interesting question. I never would have thought of doing a book on, uh, on Mormonism, uh, but we worked on this cover story. I, I'm going to amend what Barbara said, which uh, was what she was given in an earlier press thing, which we cleaned up. But um, my colleague at time, David Van Bema, actually wrote the cover. I was the full-time religion specialist as a staff correspondent, which means a field reporter. This is the way news magazines work on most of their stories. And uh, Sam Gwynn, or S.C. Gwynn, who is the Austin, Texas bureau chief, uh, in those days he didn't have George W. Bush to worry about, so he uh, had an extra month to spend investigating Mormon wealth and uh, church financial operations. So, and I did the, uh, the more religious side of things. And uh, we sent our material in, and the cover was one of the best sellers of the year. So I mentioned this just in passing to uh, a uh, promotion guy with uh, Harper San Francisco. And lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, uh, John Loudon, the editor out there, called and said, hey, I think there's a book in this. So then why write this book? Well, the answer is basically that it hadn't been done. Now, this is astonishing. This must be, I mean, think about this, folks sitting here in Salt Lake City. Uh, nobody had done a general audience book covering all of the facets of the Mormon phenomenon written for the average, you know, general reader. This is really striking. And I think it struck me and it struck the publisher, well, this is something obviously that somebody is going to do and also something that somebody ought to do. So that's how we got into this. And it proved to be a much more challenging assignment than we thought going into it. For instance, if you got the, uh, the uh, catalog, uh, it was announced as a 320-page book, and it weighed in at, uh, where are we, 450. That's, that's a rough index of <laughs> what we ran into. And a lot, we found a lot of issues that were important and needed to be explored that had not been touched at all in popular treatments. In other words, things that are going on in the internal 
discussions in more esoteric levels among scholars or rarely read books or small circulation publications like Dialogue, which some of you here may be familiar with, but the average American's never heard of Dialogue or, or publications like that. So we decided to uh, pull some of this together and it, it really was a challenge. And it was a challenge in several ways. Uh, first, uh, um, Barbara mentioned wealth. This, I mean, this was just sitting there. It just makes a reporter's uh, uh, gland salivate, you know, the prospect of trying to get at this. And we were fortunate to have Sam Gwynn working with us. Sam uh, is one of the most honored investigative reporters in uh, uh, American economics. Uh, he's won two major awards and the Jack Anderson Award for investigative reporting which is one of the great accolades in that field. And Jack Anderson, of course, is the best known Mormon in American journalism. Um, so we had uh, Sam rework his material, along with a very interesting, I hope, appendix in the book, which explains how we came up with some of our estimates. Very late in the game, we came across a gold-plated inside source which enables me to say tonight that I think the financial stuff that we have here is really solid. Uh, what we did, we got somebody who really knows what he's talking about. We said, look, we want this to be the best possible book. Now, we're not asking you to tell us anything you know, but we want you to look at the numbers and tell us how far off we are roughly, or is this reasonable, is this unreasonable, is this right, is this wrong, is this off the planet? give us your guidance and we negotiated and he was willing to do that for us and uh, we came in pretty close so Sam was really quite uh, conceited about this he said boy you know we uh, did really well uh, anyway so the money thing is a big challenge uh, how the Mormon system really works this is very difficult to get at uh, for instance, if you get the denominational almanac uh, maybe we have some church members here and are familiar with that publication uh, it lists all the apostles and the, uh, you know, presidents of the 70 and so on and so, on and so forth. It doesn't tell you what they do. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, also, some of the very most important people in the Mormon religion are not listed in that book by function. For instance, anybody here know who runs the foreign mission operation uh, down at Temple Square? You know that name? No, I didn't think so. It's uh, Earl Tingey. Now, if you want to do the same thing with Southern Baptists, who are the largest Protestant body in the country, uh, it's a guy named Jerry Rankin, who has an office in Richmond, Virginia. And he's in the Yearbook of American uh, Churches, and he's in the Southern Baptist Annual, and if you don't know, you can just call up and, you know, get, they have a public relations guy, you can get him on the phone. Now, admittedly, you can do the same here, which is what we did, but it isn't easy to get at that information. Or there's the famous Church Handbook of Instructions. Did you read the uh, story, was it last week when that federal lawsuit was filed? Uh, now, this is a good example of why Mormonism is so tantalizing as a project for an outside uh, journalist such as myself. Where have we ever had a religious denomination asking the federal government through the federal judiciary to prevent members of a church from seeing excerpts from the manual by which the church is governed. Think about this. This would be like the Pope of Rome asking the United States Supreme Court to take the code of canon law and make it a secret document by federal judicial fiat. Now, admittedly, he was using copyright law, which is a very interesting uh, technique. But this is just astonishing. I mean, these things do not happen with Presbyterians or with, uh, you know, name your, name your group. So again, very interesting. Um, how and why leaders are chosen? Uh, we didn't get at that at all. We didn't even give it a shot, you know. But uh, now, that's an example of something that's very similar in another religion, namely the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, however, the College of Cardinals leaks. So uh, we can usually get a pretty good, I mean, we pretty well know who voted for John Paul II in the conclave in 1978 and why they voted for him, and who voted for the losers, and why, and so on and so forth. You can, you can pretty well smoke that out. Uh, you cannot find out, and you will never find out, why so-and-so was chosen as an apostle. 
Uh, I mean, obviously, they're qualified, they're bright, they're devoted to the church. I mean, that's, that's the simple thing. But that would be true of maybe 2,000 other uh, gentlemen of similar age, right? So uh, obviously, there are a lot of very interesting things there. So that's, that's a failure of this book. We do not remotely explain, nor do we look into that. And um, as was mentioned, the, the Mormon mosts are worth reflecting on for a moment. Um, the, most, the wealthiest church per capita. I mean, obviously, the Catholic Church uh, is wealthier, but it's vastly bigger in this country. Uh, the most secretive of the major religious groups in this country. The most authoritarian uh, of the large groups. The most centralized. Uh, the most mission-minded. Uh, other groups are mission-minded, but Mormons outdo all others, uh, with the exception, perhaps, of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And the most welfare-minded. The uh, LDS welfare system is unique in American religion. And the most education-minded. Uh, we have nothing remotely comparable to Brigham Young University in any other religious body, either in size or in the nature of the church uh, uh, control of the campus. And then uh, the educational system at the, uh, the high school level, the seminary system, is, is just uh, requires a devotion on the part of high school students that you do not find in any other religion uh, in this country. So there's just the Mormon mosts uh, are continually fascinating. Uh, I'm going to open up for questions in a few minutes, so think about what you might want to uh, ask me about. Um, what was the hardest thing in this book? Somebody asked me this uh, in an interview in the last couple days. And there's no question that the theology chapters were the most difficult. And there are a couple reasons for that. The, the first is that you're dealing with complex matters, obviously, uh, uh, concepts of God and of Scripture and so on. And also they're delicate matters. I mean, you're getting to the very heart of a faith and you want to deal with it uh, respectfully and carefully and yet uh, candidly if there are issues. And so that took a lot of uh, tender loving care, that part of the book. But there's another aspect that you may not have thought about, and that is it's hard to get at what Mormonism believes. Now this may seem an astonishing statement. And I just had a, uh, uh, an interview this afternoon after our, our luncheon with, uh, with an LDS reporter who uh, didn't quite understand what I was trying to get at when we were talking about this and really basically rejected the premise. But in, in LDS religion, you have a mass a mass of material. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books on teachings and doctrines and everything else. So how could you say it's hard to get at it? Well, the reason is we do not have authoritative definitions on many of the most important aspects of religion. So that if you say something is true, the church can say, well, that's not an official teaching. That's one man's opinion. Or this was said then, but maybe it's you know not pertaining now. Or it's never been canonized. It hasn't been sustained at a general conference. Or it's not in the Mormon scriptures, uh, the standard works, and so on and so forth. Compounding the problem, the you don't have anything remotely like, for instance, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, I don't know if that on sale here. <laughs> Um, so here you have a nice, paper, cheap, paperback compendium of everything the Catholic religion believes about everything. And it's all nice and crisp, and it's indexed, and, you know, it's a very handy thing. I have it on my desk at work, as you would imagine. Uh, okay, in Mormonism, you have Bruce McConkie's Mormon Doctrine, but it's extremely controversial, uh, very conservative, and also it's not official, even though he was an apostle. There was quite a bit of uh, rancor about the publication of this book, in fact. So the book itself is an interesting controversy. Then we have the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, which is kind of official. I mean, it's mostly BYU professors writing. I mean, they should know what they're talking about. But it's not quite official doctrine, okay? Then we have Gospel Principles, if you're familiar with that, which is an adult education manual uh, for the church. But it covers very little of the Mormon religion. Very little of the Mormon religion is in Gospel Principles, which is the only document that I think you could consider comparable to, let's say, the Catholic Catechism. That is, a doctrinal book with the full authority of the church behind it. 
So, uh, and then we found that there is a lot of confusion or disagreement or ambiguity on a number of important points in Mormon theology. We struggled and we tried to do the best we could with some of these issues, but basically we just tried to depict the debate and who some of the players are and kind of point the reader in, in the right direction. I think what I just, the situation I just <coughs> described will occur as long as Mormons, along with Jehovah's Witnesses, are a major American religion without theologians. Uh, it's the, oh, these are the only two religions I can think of that do not have any theologians and basically take pride in not having. That is, people who are trained in theology as an academic discipline and interact with other theologians from other traditions uh, in an academic setting. There are, of course, theologians who teach at Brigham Young, and they have some role and influence in the church, but it's not as though they are part of the doctrinally defining apparatus uh, of the LDS religion. Uh, just a couple other points. Um, two things that we were, we were sort of indicated to us it would be really nice if the book didn't get into, polygamy and race. Uh, and these are probably the two best examples of um, uh, what, what one, one particular uh, member of the, the church staff kind of indicated, you know, it'd be really nice if you didn't have to get into those. And, and the rationale is that that's all behind us, which of course is true, but it isn't quite true. And the fact that it isn't quite true means it's fascinating fodder for journalists. Uh, Polygamy ended in 19, 1890 and then was ended again in 1904. That's an interesting passage of 14 years, which we deal with in the book. Uh, but as you're well aware, polygamy survives in Utah and elsewhere. Now why? Why do we have uh, ten, perhaps tens of thousands of polygamists in this part of the United States uniquely? There's one reason and one reason only, and that is a revelation given to the prophet Joseph Smith as a founding principle of the, uh, uh, an early, I shouldn't say founding, an early principle uh, of the restored uh, church. So that's where it comes from, and therefore it's part of the LDS story, and it's part of the LDS story in 1999 by virtue of the fact that dis self-identified disciples of Joseph Smith are practicing Joseph Smith's teachings in Utah. So it's, and also it's a policy issue of some importance for the now monogamous uh, uh, Salt Lake City-based church. So it, it's relevant there as well. Similarly on race, uh, as you know, 1978 was a watershed in LDS history when President Spencer Kimball said that persons uh, with African blood could be allowed to be ordained priests uh, at age 12 and up. In other words, to be a, participate in all the levels of the church the way uh, any Caucasian member or members of other races could. This was the beginning, in my opinion, of the great Mormon missionary expansion worldwide. It is a decision that allowed this to happen for the first time, and it made Mormonism a fully legitimate and accepted part of the American culture. Uh, okay, so it's very important for Mormon mission history. So for that reason alone, the book has to deal with it. But in addition, it's a very tough problem in 1999. Uh, there are some few African-American Mormons who take offense at the fact that McConkie's Mormon doctrine contains elements of the old racial theology. So it is, and this is the most widely used, quoted, and read uh, book on Mormon doctrine by, uh, you know, institute teachers and so on. So, I mean, it, it's still a bestseller. Uh, and, and now that Bookcraft has been purchased by Deseret, it's published under the auspices of the LDS Church per se. Therefore, what is in that book and other documents like it and what is out in the culture is still a problem for certain African Americans. And therefore, it's a, an issue that, of course, flared up uh, last year. Well, these are just a few random uh, uh, introductory things. Well, let's get into some uh, questions. We'll go for maybe uh, 20 minutes or so and, and do some book signing and all that. Yes, sir. Oh, well, first of all, I want to compliment you on the book that you wrote. Uh, I've been trying to keep my ear to the ground 
for the last 30 years. I've been born and raised in the Mormon church, but it wasn't until about 30 years ago I started to try and find out what was really going on behind the scenes because nobody would give me authoritative answers in many areas. And uh, I was just amazed at how comprehensive a grasp you have of, of our culture here. Um, as I, uh, and I haven't read the whole book through, but as I've read uh, many of the chapters, as I would start reading them, I would say, well, uh, boy, I wonder if he'll get into this. I'm, uh, this. This is something that just happened three or four months ago. I wonder if he's uh, uh, up to date on that. And by golly, you've had most of it in there. So I want to thank you for writing this. This is probably the best book that I've uh, ever read by an, an outsider. By the way, there have been other attempts to write books like this before, which you're probably aware of, Gottlieb and Wiley and mm -hmm. Wallace Turner and some of those others. Mm -hmm. But um, one question I have in here, it's a small one, and that is that you say that in 18, I think it's on page 87, you say that um, in, in, uh, in 1890, the manifesto was not viewed as a revelation. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't find where you went on to say that with the publication of the new doctrine, uh, the new public uh, edition of the Doctrine and Covenants in 1981, after the manifesto, they now put in that quote from Wilfred Woodruff in the talk that he gave up in Logan, where he said that um, uh, it, it was a revelation that God had shown to him what would happen to the church if he didn't abandon it, that uh, the church would just be destroyed. And so he That's interesting. Went ahead and did that. But, uh, now, that, so this was. Uh, so this was an addition to the standard works in 1981? Uh, 1981. Okay. See, the Doctrine and Covenants that I've used in my triple combination since my youth mm -hmm. had it the manifesto not in, there. in there, Yeah. but it didn't have that explanation. Uh -huh. And then when I was in law school, I, uh, somebody showed me a copy of Sidney Sperry's book on the Doctrine and Covenants compendium, and in a footnote, he had this quote of Wilford Woodruff, and I said, gee whiz, uh, you know, because people have challenged me all the time, well, that isn't doesn't state it to be a revelation. I said, well, gee whiz, here it is right here. I wonder why the church doesn't have that. Well, hmm. I guess the church finally caught up with that and put that in at the end of the manifesto as a, uh, an addendum so uh, hmm. they, to cover their bases or, or, or whatever. But it had been in, in existence for a long time, and it's just, they, they just, uh, uh, it just surfaced. See, this is, this is why you don't want to write on Mormonism, because you always find out something new. This is this is new to me, so uh, Yahweh willing, we'll have a second Did edition. Do you have a copy of the latest? Uh, I I do, and and I didn't notice that. Okay, well, and nobody's pointed that out. Needless to say, uh, in in official circles, I mean, it's a very important point. Yeah, it. Well, I believe it's still there. Yeah. Uh, last I looked. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll uh, take a look at that. I scurry see. home. I'll I'll check that. But but I mean, with that exception, I mean, I'm just amazed uh, at what you've done, and I want to thank you for that because I'm telling people now if they really want to know the entire story of Mormonism, mm -hmm. not just what's put out officially, and not just what the anti-Mormons polemically mm -hmm. uh, rail on about. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to read this book because this is, uh, you, you have all the, the, the problems as well as the good things, everything that's going on behind the scenes as well as in front of the scenes, mm -hmm. um, and it gives everyone a comprehensive view without uh, having people need, uh, need uh, uh, without people needing to say, well, is it pro or anti? And, and that's mm -hmm. what the question is you get most of the time. Well, does it, you know, is it pro or anti? And yeah, we you go right down the middle. Yeah, we, we tried to uh, keep two audiences in mind. The one, obviously, <coughs> it's here are the Mormons for the non Mormon audience nationwide. This is a general trade book from a major uh, publishing house. So we, that was one of our purposes, but I think we also wanted to inform the Mormon people about their own church because I think there is material in here that the average workaday Mormon is not aware of, and I, th I think some of the material, some will be very familiar. Like probably everybody in the room, Mormon and non-Mormon, knows about temple in this state, knows about temple garments, right? And the, uh, the word of wisdom and. Uh, tithing, I mean, some of these things which, of course, we go into for the general reader who may not know about it. Uh, but I think there's some other things that will be, uh, will, will be new, I hope, and, and informative. Like you said in there, um, you were astonished, and I have been astonished, too, at the lack of curiosity of most members of the church about how their mm -hmm. church is governed. Yeah, for instance, I can tell you for sh certainty that if the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant group in the country, about three times the size of the LDS Church, 
tried to handle its finances the way the LDS did, there would be a hue and cry that you could hear on the moon, you know. They, they would not stand for it. Uh, they, those Baptists, they want control of that local church and they want to know where every dime is going to Nashville and what it's being used for. And it's audit this, audit that, and everything else. I mean, everything is, is very, very uh, open. They, of course, they, all of the conflicts in the Baptist Convention are also public. All of the conflicts in the Mormon hierarchy are carefully uh, kept from public view. Uh, so that's, that's another uh, contrast. Another uh, question back here, I think I saw somebody. Let's see. Yes? Um, you, you said that the Mormon Church, one of its most was that it was the most authoritarian. And I guess that surprised me a little bit because I would have expected, for instance, the Southern Baptist Church or maybe Jehovah's Witnesses to be mm -hmm. even more authoritarian. And evidently that's not true. I wonder if you could Actually, I'll take it back. Jehovah's Witnesses are more authoritarian. I'm glad you said that. So always be careful with the superlatives. Um, but what I mean by that is the, um, especially in the selection of leadership, uh, the Mormon system is, is almost unique in the way in which it is governed. That is, everything's strictly top down. Now, most people th uh, who are not Catholic think, t tend to think of the Catholic Church as being the same way. Uh, but the process, by even the very select, secretive process by which a pope is chosen, is more consultative than the way in which an apostle uh, is chosen. Uh, similarly, the leaders of the religious orders, which are a huge and powerful aspect of the Catholic institution, are chosen usually in general chapter meetings with delegates from all over the country or all over the world, like the Sisters of Mercy. Uh, just had an open election of their new leader in St. Louis uh, some weeks ago. And I mean, this thing happens, happens all the time. Uh, similarly, most uh, parishes are governed these days, in America at least, by elected councils. Most dioceses have priest councils, which are all the clergy in a diocese who get together to uh, discuss policies with, uh, with the bishop and so on. Now, the bishop still ultimately retains uh, power in a lot of ways. Uh, Protestantism, of course, is, is more democratic in its form of government. Uh, all religions, however, have aspects that are not subject to democracy, namely their basic founding doctrines. I mean, you don't go to a, a Presbyterian uh, session and say, well, is the Bible going to be the Word of God this year? You know, let's take a show of hands, right? I mean, there are certain things that are given, and uh, they remain so. So doctrinal matters in most successful religions are not subject to democracy, uh, in the same way as other aspects. But in what I might call the temporal side of the church, you know, the money and the choice of leaders and setting of policies, uh, Mormonism is a striking institution in the way in which ward operations in Papua New Guinea are controlled uh, a few blocks uh, west of here. Uh, can you have a piano? Do you have to, can you use a guitar? What, what hymns are you going to sing? Uh, what, uh, what curricular material is the Women's Relief Society going to be studying in Argentina? I mean, it could go on and on. All of these things are highly centralized uh, in a way that would not be true in most other religions, Jehovah's Witness being a very good, uh, thank you for that, exception. Uh, and actually, interestingly, Christian science tends to be that way in some aspects. So, right, right in the back. What reasons do the Mormons give for choosing their leaders the way they do, and what do you think about those reasons? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, they do it because it's been done. I think that's the, the simple answer. This is the way we've always done it, and I think they're continuing the pattern uh, of church government that Joseph Smith laid out. Uh, some of these things are, are scriptural, I suppose, but a lot of them really aren't. They're, they're iron folkways, I think I would call them, you know, that just, I mean, the, well, actually, the, the best example, uh, and this is very familiar to all of you, of, of choice of leaders being distinctively Mormon is, of course, the elevation of the uh, president, which is done by whichever apostle has governed the longest uh, automatically <coughs> becomes president. Now, most religions, let's, let's take the, the choice of a pope again. Uh, instead of 12 apostles, we have 120 cardinals. They meet in secret, uh, so there's a similarity. It's kind of a, you know, a men's club, and they decide who the leader is going to be. 
But there's a key difference uh, in the choosing of a leader. In the Catholic system, in, in the Mormon system, it's going to be one of the apostles, right? In the Catholic system, it's going to be one of the cardinals. That's similar. However, as you know, it's any of those cardinals. You know, it's, uh, they can go for any of these people. And what do they do? They choose the man that they think is the best qualified at that point in the church's history. Uh, the LDS church, believing, I guess you would say that all of the apostles are pretty much equally qualified, figures, well, we're going to put the, old, uh, the, the longest serving and very often among the oldest uh, apostle in. It's kind of a different way of, of doing it. Um, I think that could change someday, but it'll change only after a constitutional crisis where you have a, uh, a mentally unstable, for instance, uh, a senile president who does something that's devastating for the church uh, through no fault of his own due to disease. Uh, something like this may happen someday, and then that'll cause a uh, re-examination. So that, I kind of waltzed around the heart of what you asked, but the answer is I don't know. <laughs> uh, yes, I think you were first, and then you. Does this um, idea of this leadership coming from the top and accepting things exactly on faith count, account for the lack of curiosity among the young people, which is noticeable for teachers? I suppose. I mean, it's it's distinctive part of Mormon culture that the faithful, the, the really active, involved member of the church, uh, it's a no questions asked kind of a thing. There is this compared with other religious bodies, a singular lack of curiosity and engagement in things that really cause people to stay up nights, uh, you know, fiddling around in other religious bodies uh, because they are more... Uh, and I must say, if that were not the case, uh, I probably would be out of business as a religion writer for the Associated Press since the majority of my time is spent writing about Presbyterians fighting uh, in the last few days about homosexuality or Baptists uh, mixing it up with Jews about evangelism a few weeks ago, or, uh, you know, I mean, now this is the stuff of, of what I do for a living. Mormonism is almost bereft of that type of discussion uh, because the membership of the church are not engaged and involved in any of these policy matters, and therefore there's nothing to be discussed. There is, of course, a small group of question-raising, uh, you know, dissenters or... Uh, whatever, but uh, they, this is not the main body of the church. It's the folks that gather at the Sunstone Symposium. Uh, by the way, the Sunstone Symposium, this is just a random thought, but is almost unique be because other groups fight all this stuff out all the time in their governance. The Sunstone Symposium is one of the most interesting occasions uh, in an American denomination. There isn't quite the same annual equivalent in any other group that I can think of. Uh, again, when you say a superlative, somebody will come up with an exception. But this is the one and only place where all of this stuff is thrown out on the table and people argue and discuss it and everything else. Uh, and it's a very focused gathering of question raising, let's call it, because there isn't much else of that type of activity going on. So that's unusual. Right, uh, publicly. To to yeah, not discussed publicly and, and officially. That's right. And you, you know, read church news and you'll see what I mean. Yeah. Yes. Um, in finding out about the financial um, aspect of how the church is run, mm -hmm. what was the most interesting or unusual thing to you? Well, what, uh, my favorite fact in the book uh, that, that Sam put together is that Mormon real estate holdings are roughly equal to the state of Delaware. <laughs> now, mo uh, the review of our book in Publishers Weekly, I think, was written by a Mormon, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it was a very thoughtful piece and so on, but there was a little clue at the end. It said, they were a little irritated, why do they have to do all this money stuff in this book, you know? And they said, uh, why don't they do a piece on the Episcopalian Empire? Well, first, you wouldn't say Episcopalian, you'd say Episcopal Empire. So I know it's not a Protestant who wrote it. Little clues. Could be a Catholic. Uh, but there ain't no Episcopal Empire, by which I mean, of course, Episcopalians are wealthy, right? That's no secret. But the Episcopal Church is cash poor as an entity. 
The money the Episcopal Church is sitting on is essentially the church pension fund uh, at 815 Second Avenue. And this is, you know, paying uh, pensions to uh, retired uh, church workers. Uh, and, and that's money that they have paid in or that their parish boards have paid in. And, you know, they expect a certain return so they can keep the pension fund floating. And there's some, there's some rainy day money, which, which all religions have. Other than that, most American denominations are on a cash and carry basis. You know, the money comes in the front door and goes out the back door, spent for all of the things that Mormons spend money on, uh, building churches and sending missionaries and publishing Bibles and, uh, uh, you know, uh, social welfare and all the rest of it. Uh, but the Mormon system is unique in the amount of money that is put aside uh, in stocks and bonds and commercial <coughs> investments in ranch lands and farmland. Uh, and, and so on. There is no other religion that remotely operates uh, this way. And I'm often asked, uh, it have been the last couple of weeks, why is this? I think it's partly a response to the way Utah was opened up originally, where the church had to organize everything, including all the businesses. It's, so this kind of uh, mentality, and it's a church run by uh, businessmen rather than theologians and pastors, like all other religions. Uh, again, Jehovah's Witnesses be an exception. So I think that maybe that's uh, an explanation. Yes, ma'am. Um, the title of your book is Mormon America, and I mm -hmm. think we here in the state are more familiar with and tend to think of Mormon Utah. Um, I wonder what differences, if any, you found between the way Mormonism is practiced in the state of Utah and around the country? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. Uh, and by the way, the title is announcing to the reader, we really did not touch Mormonism worldwide. That's a fascinating topic somebody should do. Uh, what's really going on in Mexico, you know? Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, that's, uh, boy, I don't know. There's a lot you could say about that. Let me think. Well, one thing for sure, the location of temples until right now, now we're going to get a temple in Boston and shortly thereafter in New York. Uh, so our part of the country is going to open up for temple uh, observance. But in Utah, stuff that's very easy to do and is much more, I think, part of the everyday or weekly life of a devout Mormon would not be done as easily uh, on the east coast of the United States. We, we have a temple in Washington. Uh, of course, one's going up in Palmyra, New York, which is, well, be sort of like a tourist temple in a sense, because there's not much Mormon population there. So I think that's, that's one obvious difference. Uh, another interesting thing, in fact, I think one of the most intriguing things in the whole book, which we got from a Mormon scholar, most of this book is not original, it's just what we found other people have dug up, uh, the retention rate of baptized Mormons who, who per, per, male Mormons, who persevere through the Melchizedek priesthood. This is a good index of young adult commitment in the Mormon system. Uh, how, how many of your baptized people end up in the Melchizedek priesthood? The dropout rate is significantly uh, high in a country like Mexico. I'd say dangerously high. Uh, based on, although those figures have now been removed from public view, so we're, we're basing this on figures from a generation ago, when it was written about, that material was eliminated from the almanac. So we don't know this today. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, mission authorities uh, at Temple Square who know the answer to this, but, but we don't. Uh, but, uh, again, on your question, Utah is higher than the rest of the United States. Now this indicates that there's an element of nationalism or ethnicity helping strengthen uh, the Mormon faith. That is, it's, it's easier to go through the whole Mormon system to be follow Melchizedek priesthood, not to drop out, not to be a Jack Mormon in the state of Utah than it is in other parts of the United States. And it's easier to hold on in the United States corporately than it is in some other th uh, third world countries like Mexico. So and that's, those are two things that come immediately to mind. But obviously the Mormon system in its main practices is universal and is identical everywhere, which is, I think, the big picture. Yes? Okay, um, well, obviously, you know, in Utah, it's just really an integral part of 
our lives, even if you're not Mormon, it still depends. It determines who you can date, who you um, hang out Wait, with. How many folks here are non-LDS? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Anyway. Just thought it'd be interesting. Yeah, it really affects your everyday life, no matter what religion you are or what you're doing, and we just kind of take it for granted. And I was wondering, what did you think when you first looked at our state as a Mormon community? And what... Mm -hmm. just well, the, uh, this would be a better question for my wife because I've been covering religion for three decades and uh, I did my first reporting trip to Salt Lake in uh, 1964, I think it probably was. Uh, and I've been back here many times since. I've interviewed two presidents of the church. Uh, I've, you know, just kept up on it. So I, I'm familiar with all this. So there's nothing here that strikes me. but. My wife was struck by all kinds of things. So it was actually very, not only did she have full time to work on this, while well, I was working at Associated Press, so I, I did as much as I could, but having her work full time is the only reason that this book could come out. Uh, but also, she brought to it a fresh eye as she stumbled across things. She said, this is really remarkable, or my goodness, you know, look at this. <laughs> and these are things that perhaps like many of you, I had already become familiar with, so the aha factor had been leached out, you know, and I, uh, you know, I, di I didn't really, uh, really focus on it. Um, I don't know, does that kind of answer your, th yeah. you know? I, are there on the other hand, there were things that I ran into. A, a theological thing, this may s seem uh, precious, but uh, the, the teaching of Ezra Taft Benson, now this is not Again, you get into this question. This is the prophet president speaking, but it's not uh, doctrine, if you know, you know that, that dichotomy that you have in writing on Mormonism. But that uh, uh, Christ died, uh, Christ's gift of atoning work for our sins was not accomplished on the cross. Uh, now this wipes out, you know, two, as, as other things do, 2,000 years of Christian tradition. Rather, it was his personal agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, from a, a you know, conventional Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Baptist, Presbyterian standpoint, this is absolutely astonishing. I mean, how many churches have crosses stuck up in the front, you know? Uh, this is, I mean, and I had never stumbled across this idea. And then we found it isn't just a one man's opinion, even though that one man is the prophet, uh, but this is a standard theme in Mormon teaching on the death of Christ. And, and I gather, it's what I would call functional doctrine. It's something that everybody teaches and everybody believes, but it's never been canonized as doctrine, and that's true of many, many other teachings. Let's see, I think, so, yes? Uh, a couple of comments. First of all, I was really excited when I read about your book in the newspaper, and that's why I'm here, because um, I thought that would be such an interesting perspective. I am a Latter-day Saint. I'm, I was raised in Virginia, and so I uh, was very much surrounded by non-Mormons, and that's the people I associated with. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had a little different you know, experience than the people who live in Utah. But I, I can imagine how it would seem preposterous to a lot of people to think that there would not be a, you know, that there would be no question, for example, about the succession, succession of the church uh, presidency. Mm -hmm. What what keeps coming to my mind is um, in the, uh, the Mormon church, we think of it as a, a true theocracy, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, the, the direction is coming down from the Lord to the prophet, mm -hmm. and if you believe that, and believe that, well, yes, he's a human being, and he makes mistakes, but in terms of speaking for uh, the Lord to the church members, mm -hmm. if you believe that he, at, that he is a prophet and that he has this direct line from God, then it's, uh, it's so much easier to accept uh, these things. And see, for example, as far as the succession, we believe that the apostles were chosen by God, not by a committee or a democracy or anything of the kind, mm -hmm. even though we do raise our hand to sustain the prophet. But um, if you believe that, then you believe that whoever dies, it's, it's done in the order in which God had chosen that to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, so that the next person who's there 
it wasn't an accident. It's because the Lord knew he would be at that point, at that time, you know, when he took the prophet who, who then died. Yeah, I, I understand that, although it's also true that uh, in the divinely led church in earlier periods, the leadership was not set apart in that way. In other words, it became a system, and therefore you could imagine that perhaps the system could change by divine guidance later on. You know, it was a very practical answer to a terrible problem, and that is there were th interregnums, three, the first three presidents, there were gaps of two or three years, and the leadership was, you know, the church was in terrible uh, condition, and one of them in particular because of the civil war with the federal government, and they didn't have a, a president installed. So obviously the, 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 if I may say this, the politics of succession became impossibly difficult, and some kind of a clear-cut choice, quick and decisive, uh, of a leader had to be established. Now, you could indeed say this was, uh, you know, divine leading to establish the current system, you know, and that could change. We'll and that, see. And that, and I truly believe that, you know, mm -hmm. that I think God lets people work things out for themselves and then finally, you know, will intervene when necessary. Mm -hmm. But an, a, another point in terms of uh, the, the, the church leaders not being schooled, you know, somebody said to, that to me just a couple days ago, you know, how can you believe the things that your bishop is saying because, after all, he doesn't have a college degree in mm -hmm. theology. Mm -hmm. Well, again, that's kind of astonishing to an, a Latter-day Saint because not only through the institute and seminary training and so on, but um, like I've read the scriptures every day for 30 and a half years. I've never missed a day. Mm -hmm. And so I think I know a whole lot about not only Mormon doctrine, but, you know, Christian uh, concepts and so on. And that helps me to, when they come out with some uh, pronouncement or whatever, I think I can see that it, is, uh, that it is appropriate because of what I have obtained through 30 years of, of study myself. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to me. And so I, should, I guess what I'm saying is perhaps we're a little more schooled or more educated in scriptures as a group than a lot of other religions may be. Well, I think it's certainly true that the average Mormon is more schooled in church teachings than the average member of most other denominations. Uh, there probably are exceptions there, but basically I think that's true because it is, again, back to my mosts, it is the most education-minded denomination. There's nothing remotely like the seminary system in any other church body or the institute system. Uh, or Brigham Young University, just to take three, uh, three obvious examples. Yeah. But it doesn't teach you much about critical thinking. And if you of a back, type, that's true. Type, yeah. If you go back mm -hmm. into Mormon history, you can see all kinds of changes that have been made in you know, very basic doctrines that astonish me. And uh, you just wonder uh, how that could have happened, how the Lord could be progressively revealing these things like the Adam-God doctrine, blood atonement, and Brigham Young saying that the blacks would never get the priesthood until all the whites have gotten the priesthood. Uh, I'm just astonished when Brigham Young said, I, uh, Adam is, the, is our God and the only God with whom we have to do. Even though, as many people have pointed out later on, he made other statements right at the same time indicating that God, or Elohim, the Father, was our God. But why did he get involved in that thing? I don't see any reason for that. And that's something that uh, I have no uh, answer for. And uh, the church just doesn't like to discuss. <laughs> but it's something that, you know, that uh, I need to have answers for when uh, people like my son, who's struggling with some of these things, ask me these questions. You know, what do I tell them? Well, here we have two articulate expressions of two somewhat different views, yeah. which is very interesting. Um, question. Who's got a question for me? Yes, sir. I particularly liked your uh, chapter on the dissidents um, because some of the people of the September 6 were friends of mine and I, um, you, you said pretty much what I wanted to shout from the rooftops for the last six years here and I just was wondering, I guess it's kind of a broad question, but do you have any particular memories or thoughts on that? In writing that chapter, I think some of the public statements that the church came out with when that happened didn't seem to square Mm -hmm. with the actual facts, um, and was, which was kind of disturbing to me being an active 
a believing member and all, but I was just wondering what you thought of that whole episode and if, if you found out any other things in your interviews um, or whatever sources you have. Well, um, just a, I'm observing as a reporter, I mean, my job is not to say, oh, the church shouldn't have done this or, you know, so on, but just to try to describe as factually as we could what actually happened and why it happened and what the implications of those happenings are. Okay, what are the implications? Uh, it's clear that the leadership of the church felt things were getting a little bit out of hand, off the rails, what have you. Uh, one theory is this is because of the great expansion and, and prosperity of the church, if you will, that uh, as, as things are growing like this, you have to make sure that things are very carefully laid out in terms of who's in charge and what we stand for and what our teachings are and so on. Uh, the, for, from a standpoint of other American religious bodies, all religions have disciplinary processes. Uh, even, I suppose, the Unitarians uh, probably do. Uh, I can't think of a case, but, you know, it's... <laughs> I could imagine some Unitarian doing something for which he would be defrocked. I guess it's imaginable. Um, okay, but the, the Mormon system is distinct in several ways. Uh, and I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, one is the, the the procedure is not generally imitating that of the general court system in civil society that we're familiar with. By that, I, do, I don't mean that civil society, you know, determines what you believe, I mean, establishing doctrine, but I just mean procedures. How you get evidence, who makes charges, how they're assessed, uh, who represents the accused, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, those ways in which decisions are deliberated upon and inf very important information is amassed in most courts in the world uh, do not operate in this case. Some people would argue that's true in the Catholic uh, disciplinary system, but it's not as, as strikingly the case. Uh, another difference is the types of infractions. Uh, for instance, let's take a case. Uh, David Wright, uh, uh, teacher at Brandeis University uh, near Boston, put, comes up with a uh, uh, what was it, an article, I guess, or a chapter in a book or something, where he's, he doesn't believe the Book of Mormon uh, is an ancient document. He believes very flatly that it was uh, uh, a 19th century uh, product. Okay, this goes beyond the pale. This is not what the church stands for. Uh, and he is excommunicated. Um, that type of thing occurs in most religions. What you don't have in other religions would be a... Uh, average member like uh, the CIA lawyer in Washington, D.C., we mentioned in the book, uh, who was excommunicated for writing letters to the editor of newspapers that had basically factual information in them. Uh, now, he was disobedient because his bishop told him, stop writing letters to the editor. So he was disobeying his bishop, and that was the grounds for the excommunication. That type of case does not occur anywhere except, again, Jehovah's Witnesses. We keep coming back there. Uh, they, they would practice this type of discipline, but it's very rare. Usually, again, take the Catholic Church as the biggest example. Uh, what we have are what I would call test cases. Uh, the Pope and his advisors or the bishops will draw lines. They'll say, okay, this book, you know, is, is suspect. Uh, you shouldn't use this book for catechetical study. Uh, or they might, once in a while, take a theologian and say, you're not going to teach at a Catholic university anymore. You know, or if you want to go somewhere else to teach, fine, but you're not going to teach, Hans Kung is not going to teach in a Catholic professorship at uh, Tübingen, Germany anymore. Or uh, Charles Curran cannot teach at Catholic University because it's a papally established faculty of theology, so on and so on. So he ends up at... Uh, at Southern Methodist. So this sort of thing happens. Usually it is primary teachers who are articulating the faith uh, on a nationwide or in, indeed global basis and are recognized as such. And it becomes a big deal, you know, so the church figures we have to draw the line here. Uh, I've had some very interesting Lutheran and Baptist uh, disciplinary cases. Again, they're relatively rare, but nevertheless important. For any, because any church has to define what it stands for and what it believes. 
Uh, the Mormon discipline system is much broader in its sweep, in its surveillance of uh, members, uh, in its file keeping, and the range of the discipline and the types of infractions that are, uh, that are applied. An another example is Levina Anderson, who was disciplined for reporting factual information about disciplining. So you have discipline to prevent information about discipline. This is, in, in a way, the Anderson case is the most uh, unusual of all the Mormon cases because of that in, in the 90s, in my opinion. Uh, some of the, like, so let's say, the, you know, praying to Mother God. I mean, that's a basic doctrinal dispute. Uh, the church wants to draw a line. It has acted against people who hold that view. I mean, that's the type of thing that would happen in, in Orthodox Judaism uh, or some other religion. Uh, right, back in the back. If you were to describe what the church will look like in 50 years, how would you do it? The church in 50 years. Um, rather than describing it, I'll say some of the things that I'd love to know, uh, which is easier. Uh, I'd love to know if there will be any non-American apostles in 50 years. Uh, I'd love to know if, we'll, if we will ever have a non-North American uh, 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 prophet president. Uh, that'll be very interesting. Uh, and also whether the, uh, the detail of ward life will be dictated in such comprehensive fashion from Temple Square, uh, by which I mean use of music and, and things like that. I was talking to the, uh, an LDS interviewer today on, on some of these matters, and I'll pass along what I said then. Um, if I were, this is a little off your point, but I think it's relevant. Um, if I were a mission strategist for the LDS church, rather than looking at the growing baptismal figures, I think I would, and maybe they are, keep close attention to those Melchizedek priesthood figures, but I would also be scared to death looking at the assemblies of God. I think this is one of the most interesting things in our book, is using the Mormon mission progress as, and then using the Assemblies of God as a comparison. The Assemblies is important because it's the only U.S. denomination of any size that rivals and often beats the LDS Church within the United States. You'll often hear it said the Mormon Church is the fastest growing. Did we put out publicity that said that? <gasps> Shame for Harper. I told him not to do that. It's one of, the, the LDS Church is one of the fastest growing religions in America. Okay, but missions. Think about this. Uh, the Assemblies of God is a, uh, a Pentecostal denomination which was born in 1914, LDS born in 1830. So the LDS church has roughly a, a century on them, right? Um, the uh, overseas figures, LDS church today, roughly five million in, in churches related to, uh, to the Utah church. Uh, Assemblies of God, it's 30 million, so it's, uh, no, wait, uh, wait a minute, 25. So it's five to 25. In other words, a church which has been in existence half as long is doing 500% better overseas. Now, if I were an LDS mission strategist, I would ask, what is the Assemblies of God doing that we're not doing? Because uh, there, there's a disconnect here. And I would propose that what they have done is held on to a normative theology and a normative view of scripture from the U.S. tradition in both churches, right? The difference is that secondary and tertiary matters and the governance of the church is totally indigenous. The Assemblies of God related churches, those 25 million people are members of a Brazilian church. It's operated by Brazilians. Every policy is determined there. The doctrines and the scriptures are not Brazilian, right? They're part of the universal faith, uh, which is, you know, basically emanated originally from Missouri and its missionaries. But all of the life of the congregation is owned and operated by the people in that, uh, in that ward or in that congregation. Uh, the choice of music, you know, the choice of pastors, uh, everything else. Now, LDS is never going to go that far, but I think there are things to learn is in mission theory uh, in all sorts of subtle ways and, and basically unimportant things, right? I mean, 
Let's face it, it matters whether the Book of Mormon is a 19th century document. It doesn't matter if missionaries wear white shirts or if somebody strums a guitar in a worship service in Africa, right? Or is this just my, uh, my own bias? I don't know. Something for anybody here who's on a mission uh, in, a, in a ward, you might raise that in a question and answer session sometime. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I have another question. Uh, yeah, you're, no other hands up, so go for it. It's been reported that uh, in connection with Senator Hatch's candidacy that a certain percentage, maybe 17% of the American, of the non-Mormon American public would not vote for a Mormon for president because he's a Mormon. Mm -hmm. uh, to what do you attribute that and do you see any any change taking place in that or expect to see any? I heard the number 30% reported in 30%? Yeah, I'm not sure the uh, figure, but anyway, the, the generality, I think we can agree on uh, that it is a problem. Uh, I think it's probably lower than when Romney was trying to be president. Uh, I don't have any proof for that, but I, I'm, I'd be fairly confident that if we had polling data back then, and maybe we did, uh, that Romney had more of an uphill fight than, than uh, Hatch. Um, that is, I think prejudice against Mormons is declining uh, in this country. Uh, there are certain ways in which Mormonism is puzzling and irritating to some non-Americans, but there are also ways in which Mormonism is puzzling in exactly the way that other strongly zealous religious communities are. I think there is a definite strain of prejudice against uh, active believing Roman Catholics in certain sectors of our society. I think there is similar prejudice uh, against conservative evangelical Protestants. Mormons are very aware of the prejudice aimed at them. Often re religious believers who are zealous and firm and, you know, high profile, they stand out, uh, will create resistance in a culture. Uh, today, for instance, let's pick a group. The Episcopal Church is so mild-mannered and so low-key that it doesn't offend anybody, and therefore nobody worries if somebody's an Episcopalian and runs for president, right? Um, an interesting analogy might be with Jews. If a Jew were to be nominated by one of the major parties, uh, would that become an issue? That, that'll be interesting. It'd be very interesting to compare the Jewish prejudice figures with the Mormon prejudice figures. I don't know what the answer would be. Uh, but things are getting better. So maybe one other quick question. We probably ought to go to our uh, 